Hey there, everybody. How's everybody doing tonight? Just trying to let everybody file in. That's what I typically try to do is run the music for a minute and let everybody file in. A couple things to talk about tonight and then a couple questions to answer. Um, if you guys follow my social media, we had some interesting stuff uh, that I had posted today that I'll talk about here in a little while. So going to be coming up soon. Let me go ahead and uh, fix my screen so I'm not staring at myself. It's kind of distracting seeing myself on the YouTube screen. All right, there we go. All right. So um, we, uh, what I want to start talking about, I had a couple questions in the chat. Um, and if you guys don't already know, for those of you that are watching right now, um, I post uh, videos Mondays and Fridays, and I get questions all week. And I try to get to some of them, but the other ones I try to answer in these live streams. Okay, I do these live streams Mondays at 5 p.m. Pacific time, uh, typically every week, unless something else happens. So these are pretty consistent. So one of the questions that I got, and it was a little difficult to type it out, was, and it's a simple one, but it's about uh, service valves, service valves on a system when they're operating. So for instance, I'm talking about a, uh, a liquid line um, receiver that has a king valve on it. And the question was, what is front seated? What is mid seated? What is back seated? Okay. Um, this is pretty basic for those of you guys that already know, you know, about it, but I'm just going to cover it because it's a good refresher. Okay. Um, you know, you don't need to be like crazy technical, but technically the valve on the outlet of the receiver is called the king valve. Okay. Um, technically if there is a valve on the inlet of the receiver, that is called the queen valve. Okay. It's very rare that you see those queen valves unless you're on a big, big system. Okay. The purpose of the king valve is to, uh, shut off the refrigerant flow coming out of the receiver. Okay. And then you typically want to let the compressor keep pumping and it's to pump the system down for service. So if you need to change a liquid line filter dryer, if you need to replace an evaporator coil, a TXV, a solenoid valve, anything downstream from the receiver, um, essentially is going to be accessible. Okay. So we call that pumping the system down. All right. Now, um, the typical operation of a King valve, is when it's fully back seated is normal operation and the quarter inch service port has no pressure at it okay if you mid seat the valve and or just crack the valve that's what you're going to do when you put your service gauges on it so if you walk up to the system and you go to put your high side gauge on the receiver you're going to take off the quarter inch cap and there's going to be no pressure there you put your service gauges on there and then you crack the valve and or mid seat it and then all of a sudden you're going to have pressure at that now, if you front seat the valve, that's when you close the valve all the way down. So you're pushing the valve all the way into the receiver, and that is going to shut off the refrigerant flow coming out of the receiver. So what is the liquid line going downstairs is eventually, as the compressor pumps and pumps and pumps, it's going to pump all the refrigerant out of the system, and it's actually going to start, um, you know, the pressure is going to drop low, and then your low pressure control, if you have one, should cut the system off. It's very important that you pay attention to that. Uh, because sometimes systems that don't have low pressure controls, you want to make sure you shut it off because you typically don't want to run the compressor in a vacuum unless you're doing a valve test. Okay. Um, so, you know, that was just a quick question just about service valves. Okay. Uh, another thing that I want to point out is that it's very, very important that you don't, uh, or I should say the only valves that you should be able to shut down completely or front seat in a system when it is operating is the suction service valve and or the king valve on the receiver, okay? Sometimes there's a valve after the receiver. Um, I guess you can technically still call that a king valve. That one could be shut down too, but you never ever want to completely front seat and or shut down a discharge service valve, anything in the high pressure side of the system because you can damage your compressor, okay? It's important to understand that when you close or front seat a valve on a receiver, there, theoretically, if the system was designed correctly, that's the hopes, there is enough capacity in that storage vessel or that receiver and the condenser for all the refrigerant charge to be pumped into. Okay, that's if everything is sized correctly. This is where you can get into trouble when you're adding winter charge to a system, especially if it's not sized right. Where you're really going to start to see some problems is on a system that the refrigerant has been retrofitted. We used to see this all the time when we retrofitted R12 systems because the one of the replacement gases was R409A. It had a much higher pressure, 
and we always had problems with the refrigerant charge because the system was never had the right amount of capacity or storage capacity to hold the total charge when we converted the gas over. So it's very important to understand that. And we're going to start running into that problem a lot more now as we start using uh, refrigeration, um, alternative refrigerants for R22 in refrigeration systems. Because if we change to some of those alternative refrigerants, sometimes um, you know, the, we can run into problems with the amount of capacity or storage capacity that the system has for that refrigerant. Okay. So it's very important to understand that, um, you know, one of the things that I've always brought up to my technicians is, is even if you're pumping a system down, you always want to have the high side gauge on there somewhere, preferably. And again, this is going to get kind of technical, but sometimes let's say we're getting rid of a condensing unit and we're going to recover the charge once we get it off the roof. So what we would do potentially is we would pump all the refrigerant into the receiver, but depending on if we put our service gauge on the quarter inch access fitting on the king valve on that receiver, we might not be able to take it off because once a king valve is fully front seated, that quarter inch port is always going to have pressure at it. So it's very important to understand that. Okay. So if you are doing a system for like pump down that you're going to you know, uh, take off or, you know, you want to take your service gauges off, you may want to find a different place to access the high side pressure in that system. Um, another quick thing is on some of the older, um, coal pack condensing units, they had a funky receiver on there that, uh, that quarter inch service port was on the wrong side of the, um, the valve. So when you would front seat, uh, the, the receiver valve or the King valve, um, the, the quarter inch port on that, that king valve basically would lose pressure with the low side of the system. Okay. I, I know I'm getting kind of technical. It's one of those things you kind of have to see that it'll irritate the heck out of you. Um, but you always want to make sure that you have your, uh, high side and low side gauges on a system when you are pumping it down. So that way, you know, the way that you're going to tell if the system is overcharged is, is, uh, especially in the summertime, you'll see it really fast is as you're pumping it down, that high side pressure is going to start rising and rising so fast that you, you know, something's going to happen. If you, if you're pumping down a system and the high side pressure is rising more than 400 PSI, you may want to stop and think about it before you go any further because you could potentially damage something. And, you know, so we're not going to go too far into that. Okay. Um, if you, that's pretty much, that's all I got to say about the valves. Okay. That was just kind of answering that question. Um, yes, uh, I do see it in the chat right now. Do not, you need to be very, very careful, especially when you deal with the residential systems about pumping them down, uh, on a residential system, it doesn't have a receiver, but a lot of times on the old tube and fin coils, there was enough capacity or storage capacity in that condenser to store all the refrigerant charge. So a lot of times you could, um, basically, close down the uh, liquid line service valve, which technically it's not a king valve, but I mean, you could call it a king valve, I guess. But the liquid line service valve coming out of the condenser, you can close that down and the refrigerant charge would back up into the condenser. And this is on a residential split system, okay? But there's been a lot of problems with that on microchannel condensers. So you want to be very, very careful about pumping down anything with a microchannel condenser. It's very, very easy to overcharge a refrigeration microchannel condenser, okay? For instance, on a heat craft condensing unit that has got a headmaster or head pressure control valve, the winter charge, depending on the size of the valve, might be less than a pound versus if it was a tube and fin, a copper tube with aluminum fin condenser coil, a lot of times the winter charge would be sometimes four to six pounds depending on how big, how big the condenser is. So it's very, very easy to overcharge anything with a microchannel condenser. So you want to be very cautious about pumping down a microchannel condenser. Make sure that your high side port is always uh, on a place that's going to have full high side pressure as you're pumping the system down and you're monitoring it as it's pumping down. Okay, you're going to watch for the pressures in the system. I have seen some crazy pictures and heard about some crazy things about microchannel condensers blowing up. Um, and shrapnel going places because of the pressure in the system. So be very, very cautious about pumping down a microchannel condenser. On another note, as I mentioned, the head pressure control valve on a microchannel condenser, it's also very interesting because uh, the charging of a microchannel condenser with a head pressure control valve is also very different because you cannot follow the Sporlin 90-30-1 uh, method when you have a microchannel condenser. 
So that's a whole nother thing. In that situation, you'd want to lean on the manufacturers to find out what the proper winter charge is and or use the alternative method of filling the system up with the maximum amount of refrigerant, which is typically 80% of the receiver uh, pumped down essentially. Okay. So, or three quarters of the receiver is usually what I go with. Um, I've mentioned that a million times. I know it's controversial and all that good stuff, but I've even had Heatcraft tell me when I'm uh, installing a new walk-in condensing unit that has a microchannel condenser, I've called tech support and said, Hey, how do I know how much extra gas to add to this system? And he said, basically they have a published maximum amount or uh, maximum pump down capacity on that system. And Heatcraft has told me you just add the maximum amount of uh, pump down capacity and that's your full charge on that system. Okay. So, you know, that's food for thought on that one. So just be cautious. Okay. Um, I'm going to go into the chat here in a few minutes, guys, and start answering some questions. If you, if the chat gets really long and we start seeing, um, a lot of, uh, questions, you guys may need to repeat them depending on how hard. Okay. Um, Joel Monegro, you said, would it be good if I can have an illustration or a picture or a drawing of what I'm talking about? That would be awesome. If I was more prepared, I'm a horrible person at preparing for these live streams. So one of these days I'll get my stuff together and I will have a good stream for you guys where I have pictures and links and all that good stuff. Okay. But what I will do is I will try to make a video on it. Um, I don't know if I'll make a full YouTube video on it. I might just release something on one of my social media channels, which would be Facebook and or Instagram. Uh, look up HVACR videos. You can't miss me. Okay. I'm on all of them. So before we get too far into this, um, I want to point out, uh, or, or I, I mentioned something last week. Okay. I am part of, uh, an RSES chapter here in Southern California. It's called the Arrowhead chapter. And I want to plug an event we're going to have this Saturday for anybody that's local here in Southern California. The event is going to be at San Bernardino Valley College. And Mr. Eugene Silberstein, uh, he's the author of many air conditioning books, uh, the Racked Manual. He's written tons of them, okay? Uh, he, he does stuff with ESCO. Um, he's a great HVAC mind, okay? He is going to be teaching an air balance class. This is going to be a full day seminar from 7 a.m. to like 5 p.m. We're going to have lunch provided and everything. It's not a free class. Normally with RSES, we do have free classes, but because we're providing food and, and, and a place to have it at, we do have to charge for it. I would like to point out if anybody is interested, um, you're more than welcome. What I would suggest you do is go to uh, resarrowhead.com. Okay. Um, I will post a link in the chat right now. Let me pull it up. And if anybody that is interested, um, we'd love to have you. We're going to have a, it's going to be a big, big full day for us. So let me uh, pull it up here and I will post a link in the chat for those of you guys coming up right here. This is a link that goes directly to uh, the sign up page. Okay. For the winter conference we're going to have. Okay. And again, it's going to be Mr. Eugene Silverstein. And he is going to be talking, uh, presenting a class on air balance. Okay. Uh, it should be a great class. We, like I said, it's a full day seminar. So that's it for my plug. Okay. I'd really like to have you guys there. If anybody's in the local, come on by, uh, for more information, you guys can email me at hvacrvideos at gmail.com. And I can also get you some more information. Okay. All right. Um, another thing I want to point out, I've got like my notes right here. I always, mentioned to you guys, I got like a whole list of notes that I like to try to remember to cover everything. Um, I want to say thank you guys very much again. Uh, I'm blown away by your guys' support. Um, the encouragement you guys have given me, uh, the, for those of you that have subscribed to my channel on YouTube, I really appreciate it again. I know I've talked about this previously, but I never expected it to do what it's doing. Okay. Um, the way that it's been growing is just blowing my mind and the support I've been getting from you guys. Thank you guys very, very much. Okay. Because of you guys, my channel is already past 16,000 subscribers and it's pushing 16.5, I think, or something like that. Okay. So again, thank you guys so very much. I'm very humbled by that. Uh, like I always say, I'm just trying to share the little bit of knowledge that I have, um, and the small little niche that I work in. Okay. And you know, I'm just blown away by your guys' support and the comments and, you know, the views and everything that you've been giving me. So thank you guys so very much. Okay. Um, let's go through my list here. See what else I have on here. Okay, cool. That's pretty much it. I want to cover on that. 
Um, okay. Let me go through the chat and see what you guys have got in here. See if you guys have, have any questions for me. If you do, go ahead and throw them in right now, and we'll go ahead and answer some of these guys here. Um, let me turn this off. Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, I see multiple people were saying, do not attempt to pump down a micro channel. Yes, on a residential micro channel, you want to be very, very careful about trying to pump it down. Okay. Um, okay, I'm just going back up here through the chat to see what y'all have to say. Um, I want to talk about my uh, my post from today here in a minute too, but I just want to get to some of these questions before it gets too long. Um, hey there, Rick. How you doing, man? All right. Um, let's see. I see uh, Tasiki. You're from Finland. Thank you very much for coming in here, man. I really appreciate it. It, it kind of blows my mind, guys, because what you guys don't see is, is the amount of emails and comments that I get on a daily basis from all around the world. It's such a trip to communicate with people. And it blows me away. And, you know, people send me messages in other languages, and then I have to use Google Translate. And it's just so cool to be able to communicate with people with the technology we have today. I couldn't imagine trying to talk to someone in another language, but being that we have Google Translate, I can sit there and write a message to them and, you know, we can converse back and forth. And that's so cool to be able to do that. So, okay. So juxtapose, you said, what does the force defrost mode on your home refrigerator do? Well, it would force a defrost mode, I would assume. Okay. Um, uh, you know, you want to be very cautious about the, the residential refrigerators because they have a lot of tech built into them, even though sometimes they don't seem like they do. Sometimes they have all kinds of uh, uh, little user menus that you can get into depending on how advanced your refrigerator is. So you want to be cautious about messing with some of that stuff. Uh, you don't want to mess it up too bad. Okay. Um, I'm sure, you know, I'm not a residential person per se, so I can't really say what refrigerator you have and what it's doing. Okay. But I would imagine that a force defrost button would basically force the unit into a defrost. Okay. Because normally your refrigerator should go into a timed, uh, defrost every couple hours. It should defrost or something like that. So I'm assuming force would mean it would push it into a defrost to manually defrost it. Okay. Um, all right, let's go down here. I'm just kind of reading. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, um, going down here, seeing what I'm missing out. Okay. I think I'm not missing too much here. Uh, you know, for those of you guys, like for instance, Kevin, you said you're a college student stuttering computer engineering. I've been getting an interesting influx. Uh, YouTube has changed their algorithm. I think I mentioned this last week and I've been getting an influx of people that have nothing to do with this trade that are watching the videos. And it's kind of interesting to see like some people, you know, quite a few people have said, wow, this is interesting. And they continue to comment and watch the videos, even though they have nothing to do with HVAC, you know, and they don't ever have any intentions of doing it. So that's a whole YouTube thing. They've been messing with that. I actually read an article too, where YouTube says that they made a mistake in doing that and they're trying to fix that. Okay. Um, I'm trying to read the name. It's nasty, nast that. 2017 you said what are my thoughts and experience on r22 and poe uh r22 works fine with poe so you said you have a large mcquay unit with a setup and you've been going through two semi-hermetics i i would think that you've got some problems going on there with your compressors or something or the oil return on the compressors or the oil pumps or something something's going on there but you shouldn't have a problem with poe and r22 uh that's a very common thing you know, but I don't want to speak, uh, I don't work on the big stuff. So I don't work on any McQuay chillers or, or anything like that. So I want to be cautious about saying it works fine. I'm a, you know, on the light commercial, commercial refrigeration side, I don't have any problems with the oil return with POE and R22. So I want to be cautious about answering that one. Okay. You may want to do some research, but as far as I know, there's no problems on the big stuff too, but I could be completely wrong about that so don't take my word on that one so okay um thanks so much andrew okay going down in here and seeing what else i'm missing and then i want to talk about some stuff that i posted on social media today okay um now okay joe stinson this was like something we covered last week but is a headmaster and a fan cycle okay together yes a headmaster and a fan cycle control is okay to use together um, i'm not a huge fan of fan cycle controls myself in refrigeration but there is a need for them especially when you get into the really really cold climates 
So, you know, they will uh, have a headmaster or head pressure control valve that bypasses the condenser or, and or floods the condenser to uh, increase the head pressure on the system. And then the fan cycle control can be on there also to help, especially when you're working with ice machines. It's very important that typically you have them both because we need that hot discharge gash typically and or cool vapor off the top of the receiver to defrost the ice. So um, headmasters and fan cycles work fine together. Now, um, I'm in Southern California. We don't really have a need unless we're working on an ice machine to have a headmaster and a fan cycle control on a, ref on a typical refrigeration system. I'm not talking supermarket stuff. I'm talking light commercial, you know, walk-in coolers and freezers and stuff like that. So, um, I typically don't field modify a system, so I'm not going to take out a fan cycle control out of an engineered system unless there's something that's wrong. Okay. But, um, you know, I, if I had my choice, I would just have a headmaster and or head pressure control valve versus a fan cycle control at all. Okay. Um, I also feel that if you are going to use fan cycle controls, especially if you have multiple condensers or condenser fan motors, that they need to be staged. You don't want to be turning all your fan motors off at once. You want to stage them. If you have three fan motors, you want all three of them typically to turn off at a different pressure. So that way it's a little uh, smoother on the system. And you'll see what I mean if you ever work on a system that has a fan cycle control, especially if it only has one condenser, uh, condenser fan motor, I should say, it's really rough, okay? And when that thing shuts off, you're, it's it's just hard on the system. And if you watch your sight glass, you'll see what I mean. It just, it's really, really rough the way that the liquid changes. And yeah, it's just a pain in the butt, okay? So, okay. Yeah, I would, uh, like Alexander pointed out, he's saying racks have oil trouble a lot. I'm assuming you mean with the uh, R22 and the POE. I, that's why I want to be cautious. I'm not a supermarket person, so I want to be cautious about the big system. Okay? So you may want to lean on one of the big refrigeration guys that do that. There's a lot of them that are active on social media. If you go over to HVACR School, uh, Brian Orr's Facebook page, um, you know, there's lots of good guys on there that do the supermarket stuff and they can answer your questions a little bit more about using the POE with the big compressors and stuff. So, okay. Um, Eric Deeds, you asked if I've ever worked with Fetters HVAC equipment. No, I've heard about it, but I've never worked on it per se. So I don't think so at least. Okay. So someone said in here, primetime hates headmasters. Yeah, I do remember that conversation prime time where you were saying you don't like them. I do remember that. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Walter Gerard Gerardo part, pardon me if I butcher your name. You said, can you tell some info on R290? Okay. The important thing about R290 is that it's just a refrigerant. Don't stress anything about it. Okay. There's some more procedures you have to follow because it's a flammable refrigerant, but it's just a refrigerant. There's nothing special about it. It does the same thing that R22, 134, 404, MO99, all those refrigerants, whether you like them or not, they all do the same thing, okay? R290 is just a flammable refrigerant, so you have some safety procedures you have to follow when you're, you, when you're working with the system. And there's some potential safety ramifications, things that can happen, okay? I.e. things catching on fire, that kind of stuff. But as far as working with it, it's just another refrigerant, Okay. Um, what I would suggest you do, uh, RSCS, uh, go to rscs.org. They have a great training video on um, R290. I put it in the chat right there. Um, there's other people too. You can go to True Manufacturing, Delfield Refrigerators. Go to any one of their websites. They've got R290 training. It's you know you got to use all new equipment. You can't use a recovery machine. You have to use a different leak detector. You have to use different electrical fittings, different fan motors, different compressors. Everything has to be spark proof. Okay, so there's a lot of safety stuff, but there's nothing crazy technical about it. Okay, if you follow proper refrigeration practices, there's nothing different about R290. Okay, you'll be fine. It's just kind of scary. Everybody's getting scared. Okay. Um, okay. JYPHC, you say, what is the proper way to check thermostats in a reach in refrigerator? Okay. So, a reach in refrigerator uh, depends on what kind of a thermostat it is. Okay. Um, is it a digital thermostat that has thermistors? Then, what you would do is you would take the thermistors out of the evaporator coil in the air. 
you would dip them in ice water and then you'd call the manufacturer and find out the ohm value at 32 degrees. Okay, that's how you check a thermistor. Um, if you're working on a constant cut in temperature controller, you need to have some service gauges and some, th some thermometers in there. Um, you need to make sure the charge is 100% correct on a constant cut in and or coil sensing temperature controller. Okay, they're very susceptible to uh, even the slightest amount of an undercharge and or an overcharge is going to affect a coil sensing temperature controller. And the same thing goes for the digital ones too. So, you know, um, as far as exactly how to check them, you know, that's something... Uh, you can send me an email on and we can talk a little bit more, okay? Uh, HVACRvideos at gmail.com. I'm not going to go into too much detail on this live stream right now, but we can definitely do that. And I think I have some videos on coil sensing temperature controllers. Just go back, look under the refrigeration playlist, and there'll be all kinds of stuff in there. The biggest thing I can say when you're, when you're working on reaching coolers, walking coolers, and all that stuff is make sure that your, your thermometers your temperature sensing devices are accurate and calibrated. So uh, same thing goes with your digital gauges using your temperature clamps and different stuff. You need to make sure before you put a, a liquid line clamp on the liquid line and a suction line clamp on the suction line that it's accurate. You need to test it in ice water. You use some sort of a constant to verify the accuracy of that temperature sensing device, okay? whatever you're doing it with. Okay. That's the, that's the biggest thing because you can spend an hour going back and forth saying a temperature controller is bad on a reach in when in fact your thermometer was four degrees off. It's very common. So make sure that your, your test instruments, I should call them are accurate first. Okay. Very, very important. Okay. Keep going down here. Uh, Andrew Hicks, thank you for calming the fears. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I have my opinions on R290 refrigerant, but it's just a refrigerant. Okay. So now if you ask me, oh my gosh, I'm scared of getting hurt. I mean, watch, you know, just follow the proper procedures. I'll tell you that I made a video and, um, on changing a compressor on an R290 system. And I pointed out some things that are kind of sketchy. So if you follow manufacturers recommended requirements, R290 systems typically don't have service ports on them when you go to work on it. So you have to add service ports while it's under pressure. Okay. So typically you use a pinch off tool. You braze on a fitting with the pinch off tool on the other side. And then on the other side of that pinch off tool is potentially R290. Okay. Flammable refrigerant. So your pinch off tool is the only thing separating you from that gas when you're brazing on your, your access fitting. Okay. Then when you're all done, uh, if you're lucky, you come up to a system that doesn't have gas in it. Then it's easy. You just put some nitrogen in it a little chaser of 404, whatever gas, use your electronic leak detector, call it a day, find the leak, fix it, move on. Okay. If it still has refrigerant in it, then you have to use a combustible gas leak detector because the R290 is odorless. It does not smell like anything. Okay. So you use a combustible gas leak detector. You look for the leak. You, you, once you get a general area of it, you're going to use soap bubbles, just like normal. You're going to pinpoint the leak evacuate the system of all R290. And when I say evacuate, I mean, you got to let the R290 out into atmosphere. You do not recover R290 refrigerant through a recovery machine. Okay. Unless you have an explosive, uh, explosive explosion proof recovery machine. I don't even know if they exist yet. Okay. I've heard that they do. Um, you have to be in a safe space when you're venting that refrigerant. Okay. But it is perfectly legal, uh, from the EPA it's, it's completely legal to vent a natural refrigerant into the atmosphere. So if you're in a safe place, if you have a well-ventilated area inside the building, or if you have a long enough hose, you can run that hose outside and you just let the R290 out into the atmosphere once you've found your leak. Uh, it's important. I know I said I wasn't going to do this, but here we are on a tangent talking about it. But it's important that before you uh, light your torches and start brazing, um, you as much as possible, you want to cut components out of the system. Okay, if you're going to change a compressor, if, if at all possible, you want to cut the compressor out v versus unbrazing or unsweating a discharge line. Okay, but it's not always practical. All right. Um, before you uh, braze any fittings back in, you want to purge the system with nitrogen and then you want to have the system on a nitrogen purge while you're brazing also. Okay, so just be cautious. You just follow those steps. It's not that big of a deal. Okay, just be cautious. So, okay. Um. Uh, you said, uh, Joel, you said, how does R22 in POE oil for AC? It's perfect. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay. That's the way uh, R22 works fine. And then if you're going to use an alternative refrigerant, I highly suggest you change the system over to POE oil. I know some of you guys are okay with using uh, 
with using alternative refrigerants. I myself am not a big fan of it. So, you know, uh, I, I put R22 back in the system. If I am going to use an alternative refrigerant, my personal choice is, is that I want the oil to be changed out too. And I'm probably going to go with something like 407C if we're working on an air conditioning system. Um, I haven't used 407C yet. I've been through the last two summers of this R22 phase out and I've only used, uh, I have used one alternative refrigerant and that was R427A. I've had mixed results with it. I prefer to use R22. That's my personal preference. Okay. But if I had to, I would probably go with 407C or 427A and I would change the oil over to POE. That would be my personal preference. Okay. But POE works fine with R22. That's a, that's a common thing. In fact, if you order a new R22 compressor today, it's going to come with POE oil in it. So, all right. Uh, keep going down into here. Yep. Alexander said old school recovery in a bucket of water. Just make sure that you pull that hose out of the bucket of water before the, uh, the, the refrigerant charges completely out. Cause you don't want it to suck any of that stuff in there. <laughs> um, but I honestly wouldn't use a bucket of water. Alexander was just kidding, but I just let the stuff go. Um, yeah, Ulysses says he really hasn't had too many problems with headmaster valves, only the ORI valves. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to say I've had a lot of problems, Ulysses, with the ORI valves. Um, don't work with them a lot because most of my stuff is the smaller light commercial stuff. So we're usually using the LAC valves, which are just basically the, the normal head pressure control valve that everybody thinks of. Kind of looks like an expansion valve with a dome on the top. But, um, but the ORI valves, I, yeah, I really haven't had much of a problem with them, but... Um, again, I'm in a mild climate in Southern California, so, you know, it's freezing outside guys right now and it's probably 48 degrees and we're losing our stuff. Okay. We're losing our minds. So that just shows you, okay. What we're in snowsuits and parkas and all that fancy stuff. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're wearing our Ugg boots and our big jackets and all that stuff. At least I don't have Ugg boots, but you know, everybody else in California does and they're driving their Teslas. Um, Okay, so if you guys follow my social media, something that I, I want to cover, posted some stuff on social media today from this last week, and I had a couple service calls, okay? If you don't follow my social media, look up HVACR videos on Instagram and Facebook, okay? I post on there a lot, or at least I'm getting to post more. So um, I had a carrier package unit that I had posted about. Uh, I had a service call on Saturday where I went up to the unit, and the VFD, well, the unit wasn't working. It was off on low pressure. It was turning on and off on low pressure. And what I found was the indoor blower motor wasn't running. The system has a VFD drive, variable frequency drive. Uh, it's a two-speed system. So, you know, first stage it runs on low speed. Second stage it speeds up to high speed. So the indoor blower motor wasn't running. What I found was that I had three blown fuses for the VFD drive. The VFD drive has its own fuses after the main disconnect. Okay, so I had three blown fuses, which is kind of strange. Three blown fuses at once, you know. So I pulled the VFD drive out, tested the motor, tested everything to ground, nothing. Okay. What tripped me out though, is when I pulled the fuses, I had three fuses on the unit. Two of them were 20 amps and one of them was a 10 amp. And that's not right. Okay. And this is for a nine amp indoor blower motor. Long story short, I get back there today. I called carrier technical support and I've gone, well, I shouldn't say carrier technical support. I called my local distributor, which is Sigler. Okay. And Sigler has their own tech support. So I got a hold of Sigler's carrier tech support. All right. And I'm talking to these guys and they're going back and forth with me. They called me back three, four times to tell me that the system's supposed to have 30 amp fuses. And I go, 30 amp fuses? Why 30? And they said, well, because that's what the system says. And I go, that doesn't make sense. I have an identical unit right next to me that has three 20 amp fuses and it's working fine. I go, so you're telling me that both of these units have the wrong fuses? And he goes, yeah, they're supposed to be 30. And I go, that I just don't buy that. I have such a hard time putting 30 amp fuses in this system, okay, when it has a 9 amp blower motor. I know the VFD drive pulls some amps, but I don't think it pulls that many amps, okay? It's still, so I go back and forth with the guy. I diagnosed a bad v VFD drive because I ended up replacing the fuses, and it didn't blow the fuses again, but nothing's happening. I get no power lights on the VFD drive. So it's a bad drive. So I have to order another one. On a side note, they told me that those VFD drives are like a month and a half to two months out because they've been ordering so many of them. So that's comforting to know. But it kind of blew my mind. And what I want to point out is, is you guys can't just let techs, technical support think for you guys. Okay. The reason, I, normally I don't 
call them for something like this. But the reason why I called them is because the unit's under warranty. So I wanted to make sure I followed all their proper procedures to make sure that the warranty claim went smooth. So that's why I called them. And then I wanted to point out and make sure that they noted in their system that the system has wrong fuses, da 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 da, da you know? So that one kind of blew my mind, you know, and I, I still don't quite agree with putting 30 amp fuses in there. I'd really like to see some documentation with my own eyes to see that that thing takes 30 amp fuses. And I and I, I questioned him too. I said, are you sure you're not talking about the main fuses for the unit? And he says, no, these are just the fuses for the VFD drive. And he's telling me, and I, ha I talked to, you know, some guy and then I talked to his supervisor too. And both of them are saying 30 amp fuses, which I... I still don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me, putting 30 amp fuses on a 9 amp motor. It just blows my mind, you know, because the unit already has 60 amp fuses on the main disconnect. It just doesn't make sense to me. But still, it blew my mind, the quality control, that we had two 20s and a 10 in it. And then, if you guys, if any of you follow my social media, you saw that I also posted today about another unit at that same restaurant that had... Uh, a refrigerant leak on the factory braze joint from the factory too. And they use like a soft solder, like stay sylvate or something like that. So that was a pain too, was having to fix a factory joint. And I had just sold the customer these units less than a year ago. It'll be a year in March. So I'd, I've been the only person that's ever worked on them. Even at my company, I'm the only person that's worked on these. So I know nobody else has been in here changing anything up. Just blows my mind that we ran into this problem, man. Alexander, you got a hunch? As to why it has the wrong fuses, let me know if you think. Any of you guys have any input on that? You guys run into this problem before? Yeah, Travis, that's frustrating to me too because uh, the manu as I was talking to the manufacturer, they were telling me that I was going to have to program those drives in the field after I get them, which sounds very frustrating to me too. That didn't make sense to me. So... Um, Nordine elevators and fans you said is carrier better than train honestly I don't think any of them's better than any of them they all have problems probably for some amp peaks in some areas yeah I guess that's a possibility Alexander I just I wish I wish that they would have uh you know given me a reason like you know tech support just says oh no it takes 30s and I go why and he goes well because the paper says it does and it's like no I want to know why like there's got to be some detail as to why this thing's going to take 30 you know um, yeah, we definitely, definitely have bad power in my area, Alexander. We have brownouts all summer. So, uh, Francisco Onate, you said, do I do HVAC installation on new construction? No, I don't. I don't do any, uh, installation work. Occasionally I've done some commercial installation work, but I usually get bit and it's, it usually doesn't work out too well for us working with general contractors. It's kind of a pain. Um, I'm more of a service guy. So I do service and then retrofits of existing systems. So um, Chan Chow, you said what usually goes wrong with VFDs? Well, first off, I'm dealing with light commercial. So I deal with small VFDs. So there's really not a whole ton of troubleshooting to the small ones other than making sure you have proper power. I would argue that in my area, because we have uh, voltage drops and spikes and brownouts and different stuff that I think a lot of our problems could be solved if we had better power conditioning coming into our buildings, meaning some kind of phase monitors with um, control systems that will shut things down if the voltage drops too low, Some something similar to like the little ICM uh, linebacker chinguses and you know the things that monitor voltage phase monitors and different stuff like that i think if we put that stuff on more of our equipment that that would be better and our systems would work a lot better so um yeah eric deeds all the fuses were factory so oh that's interesting g salas yeah interesting man hey fire alert how you doing man Francisco, sorry, bud. Yeah, if I don't post a question, you just keep posting it, guys, because I, I try to get to them. Um, if anybody else has any new questions, let's go ahead and post them in. Um, let's talk about my uh, my video that I posted on Friday. Wow, that one got a lot of attention, that uh, uh, key to therm evap efficiency controller that I posted. Um, well, a lot of people had a lot of questions about that, and I hope you guys understood that that was my first time working with that system. So I hope that I express the frustration that I had um, the first night because uh, uh, the first night 
that I went out there on a, I think it was a Saturday or Friday night because I tried to troubleshoot that controller from the digital display. And I've actually, if Ulysses is in here, I've already had the conversation with him about it, but that digital display on that, excuse me, on that controller is very frustrating and it messes with my eyes and my eyes can't keep up with the scrolling marquee, especially with the green light. I have actually since heard that that's why they changed. I don't know if you've heard this Ulysses, if you're still on here. I've since heard that that's why uh, Kita Therm changed the color to blue was because people were having a hard time reading the green. I don't know if the blue would make it any easier for me to read, but still frustrating. But so I had a Kita Therm EVAP efficiency controller. And what that does is it basically makes it a smart evaporator. Okay. It's a walk-in freezer. It's got an electronic expansion valve. It has an evaporator sensor, a suction line temperature sensor, a pressure transducer, um, and a, a return air sensor. And essentially it controls the electronic expansion valve, opens and close it. I will uh, say that I do notice um, once I got into the system with a computer, it was like night and day. Uh, after accessing the, uh, what do you want to call it? The, dis the, the software inside the, um, the uh, controller with the computer, uh, it changed my mind about those controllers, and I actually like them uh, after doing that. But if you don't have access to that controller via a computer and or possibly your smartphone or something, and yeah, I I was that first night I was thinking this thing's got to go because that was very, very frustrating. But it changed my mind when I was able to access it from a computer. One of the questions that I got from a lot of people, and again, I'm not an expert on these controllers, okay, because that was the first time I worked with it. But one of the questions I got from a lot of people um, was – um, how, what, how do you access it? What web page do you go to? Okay. So that controller, the system that I was working on. Okay. Um, I had a direct connection to my controller. It was not connected to a network at all. Okay. So what I did was I logged in on my computer. Now I did use my web browser, but it didn't go to the internet per se. Okay. What I did was I pointed my web browser to look up an IP address, which was the IP address of the controller. So essentially it was the address of the controller and I connected an ethernet cable into my computer and then an ethernet cable into the side of the controller. And I did have to have some help from Kita Therm's tech support. Great guys on the phone. They helped me to figure out how to uh, set my computer to a static IP and then point it to the IP address that I needed. And then I was able to access the landing page or the software on the controller. So there's nothing I had to download on my computer. There was nothing like that. Okay. It's different if you're going to use, uh, or I shouldn't say, I don't know if it's different it, now with some of the new stuff. Cause I know you can access them from your smartphones and stuff like that. So, but the system that I was working on, we just accessed, uh, an IP address. And then you were able to see the controller's brain basically in the way that it was operating and you were able to give it commands. You're able to see a graph with trending history, and it was really easy for me to figure out what the problem was once I could see that graph, okay? And my, like I said in the video, if you haven't already watched, go and watch it. But my problem was, was I was having, first off, I had a refrigerant shortage, so I corrected that, but then I noticed it was defrosting way too much, okay? And even after I came back uh, the next day, it was still defrosting too much. And I found that we had some bad sensors, okay? And then I actually did find a sensor that had a break in the jacket, which my theory is is that moisture was getting in there and messing with the sensor, okay? So once I changed the sensors out, you guys saw in the conclusion of the video, the defrost issue went away, okay? I also changed some settings inside there because I don't think it was ever commissioned properly. And there was, like, someone had it set up for a door switch. It didn't have one. You know, just had some, some features that it, was turned on that it wasn't using. So, but I do have to say, I was very, very impressed with that key to therm, uh, controller. Once I had access to it via the computer or the IP address and being able to access it. So another question that I got quite a few people saying is, Oh my gosh, you shouldn't show the IP address on a video. Da 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 da. Remember I had no network access on that system. So the only way that IP address, and, and I've also been told too, that that IP address, I'm not a computer smart person, but I was also told that it, cause it was like a 10, 10 IP address that it, you couldn't access it from the internet. I don't know much about computers when it comes to that. So, but very, very cool controller. I thought it was a very interesting, uh, video. I'm glad that I was able to get that footage. A lot of times when I go on these overtime service calls, I'm usually frustrated and I typically don't pick up my camera to film. So I've been trying to make a better habit of that because that's when I usually see the weird calls is on these weird overtime calls. So, so I've been trying to make a habit of doing that. So 
Okay. Um, Quentin Hanna, you said, do I find vote ice machines frustrating? I'll be honest with you, Quentin. It's probably been close to 10 years since I've worked on a vote ice machine. Uh, mine were older ones. Uh, I don't know what the new ones are like. I would imagine they're still pretty much the same, and it's just a big ice machine. There wasn't, a, If you understood the control strategy of the vote ice machines, it really wasn't that big of a deal. Now, uh, the ones that I was working on, they, uh, they didn't even have digital uh, bin stats. They were still mechanical bin stats that were just pressure controls, essentially. Okay. So, um, uh, those, those, those ones weren't too difficult for me. They were pretty plain and simple. They were just a pain. Like if you ever had to change a compressor because they had O six D Carlisle reciprocating compressors in them, big boys. So usually took three people cause it was in such tight quarters to get that out of the ice machine. Uh, you know, they were just big boys. Um, for those of you guys don't know, vote ice machines are a, a industrial, ice machine that they do make a couple models that uh, go down in capacity where some restaurants that I used to deal with used to have them. Um, I don't do work for them anymore. So like Joe's Crab Shack used to have vote ice machines and then El Torito Rip Mexican restaurants used to have vote ice machines. Um, they were really good at making a lot of ice really fast. So they made tube ice and then uh, you could also make like a crushed tube ice too. It would have like a cutter wheel. They were, they were pretty cool. They were kind of fascinating to work on, but they were just big giant compressors and you know big receivers and whatnot so you know not 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 too difficult in my opinion but those were older machines so okay um go in here real quick and see what else okay dj sub air you said what do i think of that system in terms of quality how long have they been around so Keta therm has been around for quite a while a lot of the big wigs at Keta therm came from a lot of the major manufacturers i, I was reading some bios on some of the people and some of the guys came from sporland i don't know if this is true but i also heard that some of the guys came from heatcraft and had something to do with the beacon systems uh, it sounds plausible, but I don't know if that's true, but that's, that's what I heard a long time ago, but they've been around, I would say mainstream for what, five to eight years, I think. And I could be wrong on that, but that's just my whereabouts of them. They started out, um, they have some small controllers too, uh, you know, um, for that you can use on like reaching coolers and whatnot. Uh, I think their quality is pretty good so far, but again, that's the first one I've worked on. So, you know, there's some other people in here that have worked with them a little bit more. I don't know if Ulysses can chime in on that about their quality. I, I mean, it seemed to be pretty decent quality, the one that I worked on, but again, that was the first time I've worked on the, the walk-in efficiency controllers. So, okay, let's go up in here. Um, go up in here. Someone is asking. Okay, so let me go back up in here. I see someone saying something about duct detectors. I'm trying to find the comment. Uh, I see, I'm seeing some of your guys' comments, so I'm trying to make sense of it right now. Uh, if someone had a question about duct detectors or wanted to post something, post it again and I'll talk about it. Uh, I just don't know what I missed there. There's a lot of stuff way back up in there. I don't want to get too lost in that. So, um, Okay, cool. So yeah, square root, you said 1010 10 IP addresses are not network compatible. So that makes sense. So yeah, some people were mentioning in the comments, oh my gosh, you shouldn't show the IP address. But I mean, even if it, even if it was a network IP address, it wasn't connected to the network. Okay. But again, I'm not a computer person, so that's not my thing. So, uh, Jeffrey Kubiak, you said, what field piece wireless should you get? Well, it depends on what you're going to do, Jeffrey. Um, I can say now officially that Fieldpiece has released their new S-Man, or not, not released, they've announced their new S-Man manifold that will work with their wireless system. If you're interested in a manifold, I would highly suggest that. It will be coming out in March and or April. Um, there'll be more information, you know, I can release. If you guys want to know some more about it, send me an email, hvacrvideos at gmail.com and ask me about the field piece manifold and I can give you more information. But um, field piece makes some pretty high quality stuff. I like it. Uh, they're local to me, so they've always been really good with warranty. I usually just drive it down to them. But I have heard other people say they have decent warranty when it comes to mailing stuff. I've also heard people say that they have problems with warranty. So, you know, it's kind of a mixed bag there. But I have nothing but good things to say about field piece. Okay, but I realize some of you guys are all far away. So, Okay, that makes sense. Uh, I'm the square root. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, Total Tech, I definitely think EVAP controllers are the future. Yes, they are the future of low temp. And what's interesting, you know, on that key to therm EVAP efficiency controller or smart controller, okay, is, you know, I thought about turning off the demand defrost. 
And I'm going to be honest with you on the heat craft, um, uh, QRC controllers, which is the quick response controller, which is just a dumbed down beacon system. I turn off demand defrost cause I've had nothing but problems, but I'll be honest with you. Once I was able to access the key to therm and see the information on my computer, it was much easier to say, Oh, this is the problem. I think it's really easy on the quick response controller to not know exactly what's going on in the system because I'm looking at a tiny display and I'm not seeing the big picture. Okay. So it's difficult, a little more difficult for you to diagnose a sensor or something like that, or a configuration problem when you're just looking at the uh, user interface on the controller and or circuit board itself. Okay. But if you can access it from a computer, I, I, I was totally sold on the key to therm stuff. So definitely great stuff. Um, oh, okay. So Ulysses says the only problems he's had is a one amp fuse blow. Yeah. And I heard you say that in one of my posts too, Ulysses. In fact, I went and looked at the one that I was working on and verified that it also had that fuse too. So, um, okay. Keep going down here. Roger Everett. Oh, uh, fire alert. You said, have I ever set off a fire alarm? Heck yeah, I have. I got some interesting stories about that. I've said, I've mentioned this before, but I was working at a, and I could say this because I don't work there anymore and they don't even exist in my area, but I was working out of GameWorks, which was a big giant arcade in a shopping mall. And, uh, I was still kind of green and I was climbing up because they were saying they were having a problem with the duck detector. And, uh, I know a lot more about them now, so I, I knew exactly what happened, but I took the cover off on the duck detector and the way they had that duck detector configured because it was attached to a shopping mall and all that fancy stuff is that whenever it went into a trouble condition, which is what happened when I took the cover off, it set off the fire alarm. Now, not only did it set off the fire alarm, I was in a shopping mall, so the shopping mall has emergency exhaust fans all over the shopping mall. It shut down all the RTU units in that entire two-story game works turned on all the emergency exhaust fans. I don't know if it turned them on in the shopping mall too. It might've just been in the game works, but this was a giant two-story game works and fire alarms going off securities running in. Luckily security came in before they called the fire department, which was cool. Cause I'm glad the fire department didn't have to roll. So yeah, I've set off fire alarms. Um, also set off a fire alarm. I had a, uh, I told this story before too, but I had a duct detector that was wired incorrectly and um, I started messing with it. And it also, when it went into a trouble condition, uh, it, this, it was a different shopping mall and they actually called the fire department. So I didn't even know I put it into a trouble condition. I didn't hear any alarms or anything. Uh, and then all of a sudden the fire department came up behind me. So that was an interesting one. Yeah. I was like, uh, I didn't do anything, you know? So when you're working on shopping malls, I've learned you really need to put the system on test. You need to let everybody know you're working on their duct detectors. Um, but in restaurants and stuff like that, yeah, I've set off duct detectors, you know, the audible sirens and different things. I usually, before I work on a system that has a duct detector and, or that has the trouble circuit wired into the RTU unit. Um, and what I mean by that is, is a lot of the duct detectors, at least with the ones that I deal with, they're powered by the RTU unit. So when you power down the RTU unit, even to change a condenser fan motor or change filters or whatever, you can put the alarm into a trouble condition via the duct detector. So depending on how the system's configured, uh, if you're working at a shopping mall, if security's nice, they'll come check on you before they dispatch fire. But uh, now I know before I touch an air conditioning unit at a shopping mall, I always put the system on test. And then the same thing with normal restaurants too. put the system on test, have them call the fire alarm company, give me an eight hour window, even if I'm there to do something simple. So I've set off panic alarms and walk in freezers and walk in coolers too. That was not fun. So, okay. Um, I'm just going back up in here to see what we got in the comments, see what I'm missing. Okay. Um, see if there's anything else that I'm missing. Okay. Um, I don't think I'm missing too much more right now. Oh, thanks very much, Diesel. I really appreciate it. Okay, so um, the other video that I posted, I just want to talk about it really quickly, was the the water leak on the walk-in cooler. That one posted today. That wasn't really a crazy technical video. That was just one showing how I go through troubleshooting something. So I want to point out that that customer did not call me out there. Like I mentioned in the video, I was already approved to change a new evaporator and condensing unit and a new line set on that walk-in cooler. And then all of a sudden, the customer put the system or put the, uh, the quote, that they had approved, they told us to hold off on everything. And, uh, then, um, 
I wanted to go out there because they said they wanted to have someone go out and look at their walk. And I just wanted to figure out what was going on. And I was able to find the source of their water leak. And it's just because they got too much grease on the roof. You guys saw that you should see on my social media or whatnot. That roof is covered in grease. Seems like a massive fire hazard, you know, uh, that wouldn't help. Um, and it was uh, plugging up the main drain for the roof, you know, so then all the water was going down the secondary drain and then it was filling up the planter box and coming in via the wall of the walk-in cooler. So it was nice to be able to diagnose that. So that way, hopefully I still haven't gotten the approval yet, but hopefully we'll get it soon to go ahead and proceed so I can get that walk-in equipment changed out. So, okay. Um, Francisco Onaid, I'm assuming you're talking to me. I only do a uh, light commercial refrigeration and air conditioning. I special in restaurant refrigeration. I specialize in restaurant refrigeration. Uh, I don't do any residential work besides for family and uh, I do a, I wouldn't even say any industrial work. I do work some for some factories doing some small light HVAC stuff, but I don't work on anything bigger than 35 tons as far as AC units or RTU units go. Um, and typically I don't work on anything over five horsepower for refrigeration. So I don't work on any supermarket racks or anything like that. Just normal dumbed down refrigeration racks. That's all I work on. So I really appreciate all you guys coming in here that are new. Thanks a lot. Again, I've already said it. Sorry to repeat this, guys, but I, I release new videos Monday and Friday early in the morning, and then I do a live stream on Monday uh, to answer questions from the week because I get so many questions. So anything you guys want to ask, you can either send me an email to hvacrvideos at gmail.com. You can put a comment on the YouTube videos. You can do whatever, and I'll try to get back with you. Don't hesitate to email me again. Sometimes I miss some stuff or post a comment again. You're not bugging me, okay? You can message me on Facebook. I'll try to answer questions and different things. I was just talking to someone else just before I went live, you know, uh, trying to help them out with something. If I have time, I'll help you guys, so. Um, okay, yeah, Eric Deeds, put the fire alarm system into walk test. Okay, is that what that's called? I just tell them to put the system in test, so. What's my favorite part about saying the phrase RTU unit? Oh, no. I don't really know what you mean by that, Casey. RT, is there something I'm missing there? I don't know. I don't know what that means. Yeah, that roof was nasty, Dave. So, um. Oh, wow. Rooftop caught on fire, huh, Justin? That's the kind of situation where that grease, you know, if even if you even have a small fire, it can spread a lot faster when you have that grease. Uh, there many years ago, I heard a story about a restaurant. Um, it was a Mexican restaurant in the area and they weren't cleaning their grease ducts and they had a grease fire in the ductwork. And somehow, I don't even know how this makes sense, but it got out of the ductwork in the attic and then got into the roof. And they basically had to rip the entire roof off the building. Um, and then re-roof the whole thing. They had to lift up all the package units and everything. And it was all because they weren't cleaning their stuff. So this particular restaurant that I made that video on, they were notified. I sent that directly to facilities and said, you guys need to fix this like ASAP. And the crazy thing is, is that I've been telling them for a while they need to fix that. And they've been dragging butt on that one. So, um, And you want to know something else too. Oh, wow. The fire department took an ax to that RTU unit, Justin. You know, the interesting thing is, is at that particular restaurant where I filmed that video today, uh, about a month ago, they had, uh, they had to call the fire department because they had an RTU unit that was smoking. So the fire, you know, whatever guy, they went on the roof and they didn't say anything to him about that grease. I don't know if they went up there at nighttime and didn't see it, but yeah, they didn't mention any of that grease to them. I don't know that they came back during the day to inspect though. So, okay. Um, no, I, I don't do a lot of turbo air stuff. Moon Sue. Um, I've worked on their turbo air boxes once or twice. They're junk. I, I that's my opinion, but that that stuff's junk, dude. Most of those companies are like Korean manufacturers, and the, the highest they're not that high quality. Um, I'd rather deal with if if I had to choose one of the lesser brands, I would choose True True Manufacturing. Um, it's sad. I've said this many times before that True Manufacturing is now becoming one of the better brands, in my opinion, one of my more recommended brands versus all these new brands, you know, turbo air. And I can't even think of the other ones right now. Uh, Ayatosa or whatever it's called. And there's a bunch of weird, weird ones and they're all junk, dude. So, uh, I prefer to work on a true, if I had to sell my own refrigerator, I don't really get the opportunity to sell refrigerators these days, but I'd sell the Trollson, um, 
top of the line versions. Their RNA series, I think, uh, they make a very, very good refrigerator. But even Charleston has scaled back on their quality too. So um, as far as reach-in refrigerators go, I prefer Kyrak with their blue system with the glycol. That's my favorite reach-in refrigerator. Um, they, they all have their problems though. You know, the Kyrex are kind of a pain to work on. It's tight areas, but they do a really good job of maintaining product. So, ah, uh, DJ sub air. You said, why did they have the grease set up as opposed to the next unit besides it? You know, that's a good question. They, I don't know. I don't really understand where all that grease goes. It doesn't make sense to me. So a long time ago, they used to have a seven, eight inch copper line coming out of that exhaust fan running downstairs somewhere. I'm assuming it's going to a grease trap or sometimes I've seen them where they had like a grease catchment system where it has a tank that heated up and kept the grease warm and then they would have someone come and dispose of it. But I just can't understand how that grease goes down that seven, eight inch copper line and doesn't gum up everywhere. I never understood that. Um, that exhaust fan that's next to it doesn't really put out any grease. The one that uh, had the grease... Um, catch on it that was overflowing that exhaust fan puts out a ton of grease so yeah i'm not a grease containment person so i really don't understand that they did have us uh put that grease catch in but they just don't maintain it they supplied it to us it was one of those things where they sent it out and said put this in so we put it on because previously they had nothing there and they were still getting grease all over the roof i would think they'd be even smart if they just put grease diapers around those exhaust fans too you've seen restaurants where they just put that foam diaper around there to catch any over that would be a great idea too because at least the grease wouldn't be flowing everywhere it would just be around the exhaust fans so yeah i don't know why they did that yeah uh nando 530 you said how many employees at my company we are a small refrigeration company so including myself we have four trucks we're located in Southern California. Um, I live in uh, Riverside, California. So we, we our service area is just the Inland Empire, Orange County. I would say the greater Inland Empire in Orange County is our service area. So we try not to go too far. So we're not a big company at all. Uh, I don't think that I would ever hire more than one more person. Um, I'd probably keep it small because it's hard enough to keep our quality up. Uh, and the more techs we get, the harder it is to keep the quality up. So you got to understand because we've been a small family company for so long, our customers expect the quality and customer service that I give them because I'm usually the face I'm out there every day. So when I have other techs that go there, there's nothing wrong with the techs. They just don't have my personality, which I can't expect people to have my personality. Um, I, I don't wish my personality on some people because I would almost say I have an undiagnosed mental disorder when it comes to my anal retentive problems and um, my OCD when it comes to stuff too. But I mean, you know, my customers expect that quality. So it's, it's, I try not to get too big. Okay. I just, I want to stay the family company that we are. So, you know, uh, it's, it's nice to be a mom and pop, but you know, okay. Let me see what I'm missing here. Uh, okay. One, two, three, four, five with temps and inches total tech. Do you have something else? What am I missing there? Prime time. Am I missing? I don't know what you guys are talking about. Oh, oh, you said Americans have different approaches to cap tubes than you do. Well, it, no, we, we still use the one, two, three, four, five, but that's like, if you use Sepco capillary tube, it's, it's called BC one, BC two, BC three, BC four, BC five. But uh, you can usually get the, I think it's measured in millimeters or whatever. You can usually get the ID. It's usually like a, I think a BC4 is like a 0.64 ID, 0.064 ID or something like that. So it just depends on the cap tube manufacturer. You know, like for instance, JB is another manufacturer of capillary tubes and they, their cap tubes are marketed as like a, they, they have the actual measurement on them. So it's a TC36 or something like that. So. All right. Um, okay, so Mega Boss Games, you said, what was the worst job I have ever been on or seen, and why in some of my videos are there oil on AC parts? Well, if there's oil on an AC part, for the most part, that's usually a refrigerant leak because um, I'm assuming 
well, if you don't already know, most refrigeration systems have what we call a refrigerant in them, okay? And that refrigerant has oil inside of it also, or the system has oil, so it lubricates the components inside the compressor typically. And sometimes they use it for some lubrication for like expansion valves and different things. So if there's a refrigerant leak, a lot of times um, a an early indication of a refrigerant leak can be oil built up around the leaking spot. So I'm assuming that's what you're asking. So that's what you might see. As far as the worst job I've ever worked on, it's hard to kind of say the worst job. I've worked on a lot of weird stuff. Uh, certainly there's other guys in this chat that have seen a lot worse than me. Um, I can tell you one of the worst jobs I ever work on wasn't so much because of a bad job. It was a construction job and it was at a local Indian casino. Um, I decided we were kind of slow and I wanted to take on a construction job that someone had called us. They cold called us and said, Hey, I'm a, they were an air conditioning and refrigeration company. There's so many red flags. Now that I tell the story, they were an air conditioning refrigeration company out of Arizona and they had quoted a job and then realized they didn't have the proper contractor's licenses to do the job. So when they got to the job site, they had to sub out the work. Okay. That's like red flag. Number one, why would you, why would you quote a job that you don't to do the work yourself and then find out you can't do the work? You think that they would have done it, but, or you think they would have known that before, but anyway, so they hired us to come into this Indian casino and it was a giant major conglomerate construction company running the job. So I went in blind and was told, this is what we want to do. We want to add walk-in equipment. We want to add refrigerators. We want you to install. They had already bought all the equipment. They were just going to have me do the installations. I had to feel, I had to supply copper pipe, you know, all the raw materials that I needed to complete the piping and everything. So, um, the first time I walked into the job, the first thing I said was uh, immediately the, the construction foreman said, have you taken the safety briefing? And I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I've never been on a construction site like this. What does that mean? So then they made me sit down for an hour long class where I watched some silly safety video. And then they instructed me of all the weird safety things. You have to wear a hard hat. You have to wear a reflective vest. I'm sure all you guys that do construction work, you deal with this stuff all the time, but I'm just a normal silly service tech that never has to deal with this stuff. So had to follow all the rules, do all this stuff. So it was a day process of getting orientated with the job. Then I went back on the second day and went over all their plans and started breaking them down in my head. Okay, what are you guys trying to do here? This is where we're installing this. You know, you need to penetrate this floor. I was going to have to use scissor lifts and climb in attics. And, and this was a giant casino. So um, the casino was never going to stop operating. So we had to work with customers or patrons on the floor, which seemed like a headache too. That was red flag number two. Um, then after that, uh, there, that, that was a whole nother day of walking the job. And then I started seeing information and I, I wrote down everything and took pictures of everything and asked for as much paperwork so I can go back home and sit and think about the job. This was all time and materials, by the way, at this point, because they wanted a quote, but I said, I needed to go through all this stuff just to be able to get a quote. So we're two days in. Then uh, I start going over all the specs and stuff that they gave me and realize like, okay, you've got this equipment, but this is a water-cooled condenser. Who's running the water lines? Oh, the plumber's doing it. Well, who's providing electrical? The electrician's doing it. Okay, I want to talk to them. I want to I want to tell them what they need to provide. Well, we can't get a hold of them. You're just going to have to tell us. They've got it all figured out. So that was another red flag was just do what you're told. We'll take care of the rest. And I don't work that way because I don't like to rely on other people to do stuff. I mean, it's one thing to have an electrician bring me power, but I need to tell him this is where I need the power right here. And I couldn't talk to any of those guys. So that was another red flag. But then when I started breaking down the equipment, I realized that, you know, I started looking up the model numbers that they had and it was a Omni temp, uh, condensing unit and Omni temp was supplying all the evaporator coils. Now they're called Omni team, but they were Omni temp at the time. So I called Omni temp and I said, do you realize that you guys are providing a condensing unit that has, let's just say a six pound pump down capacity. And the line set on this unit is going to be 80 feet. It was insane. It had to go up six feet across a building and then drop down again. None of this stuff had been communicated to Omni team or Omni temp when they quoted the job. So they had just quoted off the shelf condensing units. So they had to refix everything and redo their quote. So I pointed that major problem out for them. Then when it came time, a couple days passed. So I'm three, four days into the job. Now I start getting all my materials. I had to have a scissor lift, uh, delivered to the job site. That was a pain in the butt. This was just like one thing after another. So I had a scissor lift delivered to the job site. I had never ordered a scissor lift before. So then when it got delivered, I ordered way too big of a scissor lift to fit down the hallways. 
then on top of that, I had parked the scissor lift and I came back an hour later and it disappeared. Someone had moved it. And then I had to walk the entire job site with a construction foreman trying to find my scissor lift. It was a nightmare. We finally found it. Someone plugged it in in a parking garage. God forbid. Um, had all the equipment delivered or the materials, the raw materials that I needed for the job. And then I showed up with all my other techs. So there was three of us at the, no, actually there was four of us, four, no, five of us at the time. So we showed up with all of our techs. I, they had to go through safety orientations, all that stuff. So we're a good five, six days into this job now. And we show up to do the work. We scheduled with everybody. You're going to have this area zoned off for us. We're going to have to put the scissor lift in here out on the casino floor. We need the customers gone, all this stuff. So we show up and I was told you can't work here. You know, I was told I didn't file the right paperwork, that uh, they were never going to shut down the casino floor, that I needed to come at a different time. It was just a nightmare. So at that point, between everybody, I was probably about $1,000 of labor into this job, maybe $2,000, somewhere in there. And uh, I knew that night after all the red flags, they've been just hitting me, hitting me, hitting me. And I finally said, you know what? In my head, I didn't tell anybody. Because another thing too, I've heard horror stories about working on Indian reservations and that they're very cautious and they don't like people taking materials off job sites. So very, very cautiously in the middle of the night, I loaded up all my materials that I had left on the site, loaded them all onto my vehicle and took them out of there before I even said anything to anybody. Um, I disappeared from the job site, had my equipment lift picked up from the job site, had everything picked up before I even said anything to anybody. And then I called the person that hired me and said, I'm out. I'm walking from the job. You got too much going on here. We were, you know, at that point, probably $1,500, $2,000 in labor between everybody into that job. And I just ate it. He said, we're done. It wasn't worth the headache. I returned all my materials. Luckily, my suppliers took them all back. We ate the money on the equipment lift and all that good stuff that we had rented. It was just too much of a debacle. So we were out, disappeared on that one. And uh, that's, you know, I'm just not a fan of big construction jobs like that because there's too much disorganization, not enough people communicate. So that was probably one of the worst things I ever did. And like I said, it wasn't, it was just like a stressful nightmare of a job. So, okay. Sorry to go off on a massive rant there. Um, how many different refrigerants, Randy, you asked, do I carry on my truck? So not that many. Uh, 404, 134, R22, 410A, uh, R290, five different refrigerants. Yeah, I think that's it. I don't carry any any alternatives or anything like that. Um, at, I have I have one drum of R427A sitting at the shop, but I don't I don't use it, so... That's it. Not too many. Um, Joel, you asked me, how was it starting a new company? I'm assuming you mean, how was it building my company up? Uh, I am a second generation uh, business owner. So my dad started this company when I was like three years old. Um, I started working with him at a very young age and then now we're partners. My dad is still technically involved in the company. He doesn't really work per se out in the field. He does come out and help on construction jobs, what we call construction jobs, which is just retrofits. Uh, occasionally when we have crane lifts and different things like that. But for the most part, he doesn't work in the field anymore at all. So, um, so I didn't have to start this company from scratch. I like, I'm a lucky, I guess you can say lucky to be a second generation technician. So, um, my dad is the one that basically started it, you know, from nothing and built it up. And then I just started working here, learned everything and then kind of took over everything. Um, probably, yeah, quite a few years ago. So, all right. Um, Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, Gary, that's crazy, man. No, I haven't done any new construction, Francisco. So, um, do I remember you? Oh yeah. You, yeah. Young dagger. You said, yeah, I remember you from the, you, from the comments today. You're in Florida, right? Yeah. Yeah. I remember you dude. I commented, I, we were talking back and forth today. I told you to check out Kalos as a service company possibly to work for if they're in your area you should definitely do that and then also uh for those of you guys that don't already know i'm sure you guys know because you don't live under a rock anybody that's in the hvac industry check out hvacr school uh they have a facebook page and then they have youtube page and podcasts and all that stuff that brian Orr does so that's what i was telling um young dagger about today so um yeah watch out for fight bot ted 
he'll get you. Nah, I, I have them all turned off. He just posts links in here, basically, reminding people to hit the thumbs up. I'd really appreciate it if you guys haven't already to go down uh, and give the video a thumbs up. It helps in my search rankings, guys. So any more questions, guys? I, I want to be able to help you guys. Appreciate you coming in, Fire Alert. Um, any other questions, you guys? If not, uh, you know, I'm going to close this out, but I, I'll definitely answer more questions. So um, put them in here, guys. Uh, okay, let me see if I'm missing anything. If I've missed anything, guys, throw it down in the comments before I end it out. So that way I can answer your guys' questions. Any other questions, send me an email. Or if you guys have anything I haven't answered, send me an email at hvacrvideos at gmail.com. So, okay. Um, thanks, Nasty. I appreciate it, man. Okay. Yeah, they do have quiz quizzes on there, Alex. Yeah, they got some good stuff on HVACR school. So right on, Alexander. Thanks a lot, man. All right. Um, I really don't know much about bypass systems, Alex. Uh, you know, there's lots of other guys that do more residential stuff. They might be able to help you out. Uh, I know Ted in here does uh, residential stuff. I don't know if you know much about uh, bypass systems, Ted. Uh, he's anti-DIY HVAC. He has a YouTube channel also. You guys should check it out. He's also got a YouTube uh, TV show that he's working on too. Um, if, uh, Ted, if you want to tell anybody where they could find that, I'm cool with that. If you want to tell him in here, he's got a, it's like kind of a, a reality YouTube TV show kind of a thing going on. It looks pretty interesting. looks kind of funny. So, um, there you go. That's a good point, Ted. I do understand that part. If it's bypass, it needs a true zone system yeah, or it's not a true zone system. That's true. I do understand that one. So, um, Ooh, they might have been. I don't know if they were Golden Air. That kind of sounds familiar, G Solace. That kind of sounds familiar, dude. I don't. It might have been Golden Air. I don't know. I could tell you they weren't happy when I finally pulled all my equipment and told them like two days later that we weren't. They were gonna have to find someone else. And the funny thing is, is I did all the work for them. I, you know, I, I'm the one that fixed all their problems, you know, and, and told them what was wrong about the equipment they were going to use and how they needed to fix things, you know, and then I lost, you know, a couple grand on that job, but it is what it is, dude. You got to let some stuff go. So, okay. So guys go over to Ted's, uh, YouTube channel, anti DIY HVAC. Um, no, that's not the name of your YouTube channel. Is it Ted? I don't know if you guys can hear that. sounds like my family just set off the smoke detector. So in my house they're making pizza right now which is great for a live stream i don't know if you guys can hear that in the background <laughs> it's sitting there beeping in my back in my ear right now i can hear it i bet you my wife is trying to freak out right now because she knows i'm on a live stream uh so let's go on here real quick and i'm trying to find you guys uh here let's make sure i get this right Pull this up and I will control C because Nightbot doesn't let you guys put stuff in here. Here is the link to Ted's YouTube channel. You guys can go there and uh, check out the the trailer for his uh, his uh, reality TV show thing that he's got going on. It's pretty funny. So um, it's called the Cowboys of HVAC reality trailer. So check that out. Guys should uh, definitely check out Ted's channel too. He's got some good content content on there. All right, guys. If you guys, don't, yeah, that's funny. My family, <laughs> it should be gone by now. Um, if you guys don't have any more questions, I'll give it another couple seconds. I'm gonna close this out. So, um, snipping montages, please, and drop a sub. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Um, okay, guys. I'm going to go. Yeah, it's time for dinner. That's right. Pizza's burnt. It's time for dinner. All right, guys, I'm going to close this out. Thanks so much for coming in. I really appreciate it. Again, send me questions and all that good stuff. I'll try to get to them. Um, see you guys on the next one. Okay.